So before we uh, do so, let's just talk a little bit about what we mean by barriers in the context of bow tie diagrams. So barriers, of course, are the measures that we take to either uh, prevent or mitigate the unwanted threats and consequences. Um, a barrier that only comes into effect after the top event, i.e. on the right hand side of the bow tie, might be known as a recovery or a mitigative barrier. And a barrier on the left hand side of the top of the event are normally called preventative or proactive um, barriers. And again, just like every element in the bow tie, it's incredibly important to describe barriers in the correct context. They must be described pro uh, properly. Barriers should be independent. And what that means that each barrier alone should be able to block or substantially minimise the impact of any event. The most common mistake with bow tie diagrams is not describing barriers correctly and often taking the same barrier and describing it in several parts uh, and they, therefore taking credit for the same barrier three times. Um, each barrier on its own should be effective, independent and auditable. You, you, you should be able to determine its effectiveness. Barriers can be many uh, different types. They could be passive, like a like a bund or a wall. They could be active, like a detector or an, or an alarm. They might be hardware, software, or an action taken by people. And they may involve the use of a procedure. And it's common for individual companies to have their own terminology here about barriers. So let's go back to what I said about that common mistake. Um, so it might be common to assume that a procedure is a barrier, for example. Um, a procedure is a piece of paper. For me, it only meets the definition of a barrier, i.e. it's effective, independent and auditable if it's in the hands of a trained and competent person. An active barrier should detect an incident, decide what to do and then act. So, for example, would you say that a sprinkler system is a single barrier? It requires a smoke detector to pick up traces of smoke, then the computer system to then decide to activate the sprinklers. This is one barrier. This is not three separate barriers. If the smoke detector failed, then the sprinklers wouldn't be activated. So let's explore some of the barriers from our example, and I'll and I'll deliberately make some of these mistakes and see if you can spot them. So of course, let's look at our first threat: the cage left open in error. So you know we've got a lock on the uh, cage, and indeed there's a procedure that says you know how the park. Rangers, um, sorry, I've got that the wrong way around. There's a procedure to lock the um, cage, and of course, there's the park ranger competency record. So we can say that that equipment is operated by uh, competent personnel who are following a dedicated procedure. So you can ask yourself as we go along is that three barriers or is that one barrier? How do we ensure that the cage is strong enough? Well, you know, um, we've got a cage that's designed to whatever the appropriate standards are. Um, for uh, keeping a T-Rex safely locked up. What about the cage being deliberately opened? Well, we've got our uh, park entrance and surrounding wall that stops bad actors from entering the site. There's a, there's a park security manual and there's a command centre that's overlooking uh, everything with CCTV. So well, let's say that any one of these threats um, managed to trigger the top event by these barriers failing. What would then happen? So after the T-Rex has escaped, how do we prevent it from uh, eating or standing on people? Well, of course, there's emergency exits that people can get out. There's the park emergency response team that are ready to go. And we've got that command centre that can raise the alarm. And what about the park's reputation? Well, of course, we've got the media spokesperson that can manage the media, the crisis management. And of course, the uh, park carries insurance. So there we have it. You can see for each possible pathway, we've got the barriers visualised, associated sorry, with the correct threat and consequence, not simply written in just one uh, long list, and they're not confused with the barriers for another threat or consequence. So I'm sure that you'll all ag agree that that's a far more effective way than visualising a major accident scenario than the table. Um, but that's nowhere near the end of the journey with the value that bow tie diagrams can add. Let's go back again to Dinosaur Park. So we know that barriers are not 100% reliable. They can fail and history has shown us that they do fail. Process safety is not the absence of incident, it's the presence of effective barriers. 
So have a look again at this image and you might see that there's some barriers that have failed or look like they can fail. Um, so I've selected just a few here. Um, first of all, you can see that one of the emergency exits is blocked. People would have to stop and move the objects out of the way before they could get to safety or worse, they might not be able to escape at all. The cage door doesn't look in the best shape. There's visible corrosion on the door and if that were to get any worse, there could well be an integrity uh, problem. There's no use in a state of the art command centre if the staff are fast asleep. You might see that in the bottom uh, corner. And keep it in, in the command centre, there appears to be faults with some of the equipment. So these are just four factors that could degrade our barriers. How can we visualise this so it's clear for everyone to see? Well, bow tie diagrams can be used to capture all of the conditions that can reduce the effectiveness of barriers. And these are called degradation factors or indeed sometimes called escalation factors. So let's jump back to look at those two barriers that we've just analysed. Let's choose um, um, let's choose the emergency exit being blocked and the cage door being weakened by corrosion. So a degradation factor does not cause the event to happen directly, but what it can do is it can result in the failure of a barrier. Um, so let's have a look at how this works on the bow tie. So again, we can see here that we've got our uh, degradation factor that corrosion could weaken the cage and that could cause a weakening or an impairment of this barrier here. And indeed, the emergency exit being blocked, which could impair the effectiveness of the emergency exits. So we can go even further as well. There's degradation barriers that are sometimes referred to as controls. You can see those here. So for the emergency exit, the, you know, the degradation factor is emergency exit is blocked, but we can prevent this from happening in a number of ways. We can make sure that all park staff understand the house rules about where to store equipment. We have to make sure that these rules are enforced. And we can also ensure that regular inspections are carried out. And if a blocked exit is spotted, this is rectified and then reported. And indeed, with the corroded cage door, um, we can uh, we can routinely inspect the cage and then take the necessary remedial action. What's remarkable is that in practice, in operation, we find that these activities are actually what we spend most of our time doing. Uh, you know, that's what most of our operation and maintenance teams and inspection teams do. And because without them, our barriers might not be able to function when they are required. Now, we've of course just used a lighthearted example um, to present a very serious topic. Remember that just because we haven't seen an incident for a while doesn't mean that there isn't one just around the corner. The only way to ensure that incidents do not occur is to have barriers in place and have these barriers in good health. Bowtie diagrams are an excellent way of visualising our barriers and the role that they perform. And the use of degradation factors, degradation factors, excuse me, as I've just shown, allows us to see what can make a barrier fail and where we should focus our attention.